Currently, most bridges rely on relayers that are heavily centralized, and most bridges focus on linking only two blockchain and most link to ETH, meaning we can easily find bridge between ETH and AVA or ETH and BSC, but to find bridge that links AVA, BSC and DOT is quasi impossible. So we wanted to create a more efficient bridge. What is special about uh, our bridge? The Lions block bridge is governed by a set of validator and it has a novel synchronization mechanism based on the Hedera Hashgraph consensus services. This allows validator to synchronize in a decentralized way instead of heavy and slow gossip protocol. What does this mean? It means this bridge is cheaper and more effective compared to other bridges. It means it will enable more efficient inter-blockchain token transfers and in the future data transfer. And it means it will enable more cross-chain integration and unique products. From a technical point of view, this bridge will be open source on the dev community and our roadmap starts with the test nets and we will short after release our main net that will support at least EVM to EVM and later on more non-EVM shell. I am delighted to have been able to share our progress with you and show you how hard our team has been working and I hope you can have a better feel of how we aim to bridge decentralized finance with traditional finance by having a DEX with a trustless KYC AML sitting on top of the DEX and a decentralized bridge that we will enable cross-chain swap. So thank you very much for attending today and feel free to go on our website or Telegram chat for more information. Happy consensus, everyone. So four news in one go. Congratulations, Team Alliance Block. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you have enjoyed this panel. Keep in touch and have a fantastic consensus conference. with that malware and so it allows um, the different types of cyber criminal to specialize in their particular forte so the developers and the people who are skilled at infiltrating um, the targets and then the ransom payment is split between the developer and the affiliate uh, once that's paid so in the case of uh, dark side around 20% of the ransom payments went to the developer and around 80% went to the various affiliates. And you can see that splitting of the ransomware payments very clearly on the blockchain. And so what that enables you to do is, for example, link together different um, attacks um, to the same affiliate. So for example, the colonial pipelines um, payment and the um, payment by a company called Brentarg actually went to the same affiliate wallet and so that means you can uh, assume that both of those attacks were made by the same affiliate so i'm curious about some of the ethical questions that come into play here because i imagine you get quite you get inquiries from law enforcement and also from private customers and some of them might not have the best intentions right i mean some of it's to track crime which you know can be seen as a positive thing but some of it probably is for surveillance how do you draw the line about like which customers you you service yeah so we do uh, perform due diligence on our customers um, and we have had inquiries from certain governments in certain countries where we have um, refused to supply them with our, our products and services. Dr. Robinson, thank you for joining us. Really interesting to learn more about these uh, ransomware attacks and how it affects uh, illicit activity. Thank you for having me. All right, that was Dr. Tom Robinson, co-founder and chief scientist at Elliptic. Meanwhile, climate change has been one of the hottest topics in the crypto community lately. Today, Crypto.com's CEO, Chris Marzalek, joins us to talk about how the exchange plans to reduce its carbon footprint. Welcome there, Chris. Thanks for having me. So maybe you could start off by telling us a bit about your announcement and the decision-making process that went into it. 
Right. So we we are committing to turn um, uh, carbon um, emission negative in in the next eighteen months, and uh, we actually um, start this process by looking at our own pro- footprint. As you know, we are large scale cryptocurrency platform, so we uh, we do process a lot of um, uh, transactions on proof of work chains like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, so our first uh, stage is to just look at it and. Uh, subsequently, we're going to uh, buy carbon credits to offset this and, and turn, uh, turn us into a, take us into carbon uh, negative territory. Um, the second um, area which uh, we're focusing on is um, actually releasing products that uh, that improve the situation. Um, in March, uh, our crypto org chain uh, went live in, in, in many stages. This is a proof of stake chain, so massively more efficient from from the point of view of uh, of permissions comparing to proof of work chains. And just uh, this quarter, we are releasing um, emission free uh, NFTs on our chain, uh, as well as uh, enabling uh, uh, EVM um, uh, type of sidechain, which will allow uh, projects to migrate from proof of work Ethereum to crypto work chain very easily. So we, we think yeah. this is all uh, helping uh, create create like a cleaner environment. Have you had these goals in mind for a while or has, you know, since Elon tweeting about it really set the industry going to look at ESG more uh, clearly and more, uh, you know, in the spotlight? Yeah, I, I think this is a, 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 a kind of a watershed moment for the whole industry and, and it creates a lot of focus. And I think it was much needed. Uh, it was n- it was never a priority for major industry players, and now it certainly is. Uh, the uh, everybody understands that you know the the narrative could have shifted in a way that is not great for the entire industry. Uh, but cryptocurrency space in general has um, uh, so many people who deeply care about environment and climate change is the. The most pressing pressing issue of our time. So, uh, I think this is a fantastic uh, uh, development that focuses the entire industry on coming together and solving these problems in multiple ways. Um, besides, you know, just offsetting our own carbon footprint, um, releasing a chain that, that that solves this problem. Uh, we're also looking at, uh, I guess, from an investment point of view, if there are projects that are at the, you know, the intersection of blockchain, crypto. And climate change, we're keen to find this, uh, fund this, these projects too. So um, everybody should uh, put their best foot forward to address this. Well, just to kind of to get a little bit more granular here. Um, so you know, a lot of the press has been about Bitcoin and Bitcoin's energy consumption, but Elon Musk has kind of implied that Dogecoin is sort of a better option. Is Dogecoin or Dogecoin mining less harmful than Bitcoin? Yeah, uh, the way the way I think about it at a very high level is that you know even if you take the most pessimistic assumptions about Bitcoin and you compare this to the global emissions, it's like what one point zero point one seven percent of uh, just assuming everything uh, uh, comes from like dirty coal uh, uh, electricity, right? Uh, versus you know ninety nine point eight percent that is caused by plenty of other uh, issues. So I think we need to keep a little bit of perspective uh, here, and, and there's plenty of um, uh, of chains that you know do not have these type of uh, you know emission emission issues as, as Bitcoin. Um, uh, but as an industry, we just need to take the first step to take care of this point one seven percent, and then take it even further and see how we can address uh, the, uh, the globally uh, in a way that is meaningful and will have meaningful effect uh, on this 99.8% uh, emissions. So we, t- we try to take a more high level view of this, of this issue. Uh, well, well the, the, the goal of, of a cleaner environment is, of course, uh, laudable. Do you think that uh, Elon Musk at least created this sort of FUD uh, to get miners to purchase his, uh, you know, carbon credits or solar panels, is there a, perhaps uh, a financial incentive on his part to have started this discussion at least, um, and, and to create this this sort of uh, focus when he happens to be in the business of selling uh, things that would offset it? I don't think Neilan is a person who is driven by uh, by uh, you know, profit or money. But he cares deeply about the environment and 
you can see uh, that uh, just the fact that he moved the entire uh, automaking industry towards uh, electric cars is just uh, it's just great for humanity. So uh, he wants impact, and he's in a position of uh, where where he can have a lot of impact. Obviously, you know. We don't like this uh, the, the the way it impacts the, the short term market performance, all this stuff. Um, but you can't deny the fact that it focused the entire industry on looking at this issue and finding a solution to it. So I don't think this was this was money driven. This is about impact. Yeah, you'll be you'll be buying credits as well, correct? Absolutely. And uh, yeah. and again, you know, we the, the industry is. Uh, flush with capital. There are plenty of highly profitable businesses. This is not uh, uh, difficult to do for, and, and you know, all the all the leaders in this market have to go out there and say it. I mean, we're going to be carbon neutral. We're going to be carbon negative. Just uh, clean up our own backyard and then uh, use this uh, all this talent that is in this industry to push it forward, push the conversation forward. How much? How much of a hit, or how much of your revenues, or or bottom line would would take a hit uh, by purchasing? I mean, do you, do you know what kind of investment you'd have to make to to purchase offsets? Yeah, we we are still looking at this, and you know, there's the the easy calculations that you can do based on your on chain transactions, right? Because you can you can tie it pretty directly. But we want to look at it in a uh, more comprehensive manner, like our entire business. Uh, how does this, uh, what kind of uh, carbon footprint it generates? Um, my estimate, a ballpark figure, would be probably $5 to $10 million if you want to turn uh, uh, substantially carbon negative. Is that per year or or just total per year. investment? Per year. Per year. So, Chris, you don't think that Elon had, you know, these comments were profit mode motivated? Absolutely not. I mean, he's already the richest guy in the world. <laughs> Who cares? He got there somehow. <laughs> fair, yeah, <laughs> fair enough. All right. All, all valid comments. Thank you, Chris, for joining us this morning. Appreciate uh, hearing about your new announcement and good luck with the carbon offsets and keeping yourself carbon neutral. Thanks so for having me. Much appreciated. All right, that was Crypto.com CEO Chris Marzalek. And that's it for First Mover. Thank you, Emily Parker, our Coindesk Managing Director of International Content, and Lawrence Lewitton, Managing Editor of Global Capital Markets. I'm your host, Christine Lee. Coming up at 3 p.m., Isaiah Jackson brings you a special consensus edition of Community Crypto. Special guests include actor Hill Harper and Naja Roberts, who co-created the Black Wall Street app. And everyone is looking forward to the final keynotes of Consensus 2021. Tonight, Binance's CZ, ARK Investments' Kathy Wood, Tom Brady, of course, and Sam Bankman-Fried will all take the stage. And after that, the team on The Hash will be with you at 9 p.m. to wrap up Consensus 2021. You're watching Coindesk TV. And we're back. Thank you so much to everyone who's tuned in for all the sessions. It's been an amazing journey so far. Um, last but not least, we've made it to the final foundations session of the whole week. Um, and you know them from one of the biggest projects in NFTs in the last year. And the Top Shot um, was actually built on Flow. And it's been an amazing, uh, I guess, just 
resurgence of, 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 of NFTs is people forget that it had started, you know, with CryptoKitties and a lot of, of these other projects that kind of went a little bit into obscurity for a few months and then just blew up in the last few months again. So, you know, without further ado, I'd love to introduce uh, Wele of uh, Flow, uh, excuse me, of Dapper Labs. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Wele Yu, and I am a product marketing director at Dapper Labs, focusing primarily on Flow ecosystem. I'll be giving you a short introduction to Flow. My colleague Casey will share a holistic overview of our progress to date and what lies ahead. Afterwards, our DevX engineer Peter will walk you through on how to get started building on Flow. And finally, our CTO, Deed Shirley, will be giving a presentation on user-centric protocol design and how that makes Flow uniquely positioned for mainstream adoption. For everyone new to the Flow blockchain, you might be wondering what it is exactly. In short, Flow is a scalable infrastructure for consumer-friendly blockchain applications. And more importantly, Flow can achieve the scalability needed while being environmentally friendly, thanks to its uh, uh, proof-of-stake consensus model. Uh, many of you might also know Flow because of NBA Top Shot, uh, the sensational sports collectible application built on Flow. Officially licensed by the NBA, Topshot has been considered one of the fastest growing marketplaces, even compared to traditional internet companies. In less than a year, it has reached over 1 million users uh, and generated over 550 million in marketplace volume. However, the Flow ecosystem is more than just MBA Topshot, as you may imagine. We have a series of amazing applications already launched on top of Flow Mainnet and many are uh, in the process of doing so. Uh, and we have uh, already many sectors covered, uh, ranging from gaming to collectibles, to music, art marketplace, fashion, and many more. However, the prior image doesn't tell the whole story either. Uh, we're seeing an ever increasing number of projects building on flow. And more specifically, uh, over 300 projects reach out to us directly and we have a uh, uh, direct lines of communication with them, with more than 100 of them already made significant progress on their development roadmap. We're super excited to see them join our ecosystem and are happy to provide the support needed for them to succeed. Each project launching from mainnet will also be a value add to the entire ecosystem. Uh, we strongly believe that composability will be the multiplier effect that will accelerate innovation at a pace never seen before. One day, building an open application will become the default go-to-market strategy, being able to tap into a global ecosystem from day one. Because of that, Flow will empower developers and innovators to build open worlds and to unlock infinite possibilities. Uh, for anyone interested in exploring all those new and exciting possibilities down your head, we will wholeheartedly welcome you to Flow. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentation. Hi, everybody. My name is Casey Arrington, and I'm a product manager, a part of the Flow team, uh, primarily responsible for, for the Flow protocol. Today, I'm going to take some time to talk through what we've been up to this past year uh, at Dapper Labs and building the Flow blockchain, and then briefly touch on some, some key areas of focus of ours uh, and looking into the future. As I'm sure a lot of you can guess, uh, this past year we had an extremely busy but productive year uh, in Dapper Labs and bringing the Flow blockchain to life. What started out as our idea of a fundamentally different multi-node architectural design was brought to the public this last year as we were able to successfully launch our Flow mainnet and open, the, open up our blockchain to the world. The focus of our multi-node architecture started out as and, and continues to be focused on being fast, being efficient, and being secure. And we were able to, to showcase uh, our work around these principles to our community, not only on our uh, initial launch of our, our mainnet, but via numerous updates to our chain within the last year. At this point in time, Flow currently has 71 different, uh, different node operators. 
uh, operating 89 different nodes across our various node types of execution, verification, consensus, collection, and access nodes. This number continues to increase on a consistent basis month over month as operators are able to, to get up and running with their specified node type in a very expedited manner. We're also able to successfully deploy rewards uh, this past year. So uh, all of our node operators and all their associated delegators are also earning flow based on their participation to keep the flow network stable and secure. We've also been able to get to the point with the flow blockchain where um, we're running consistent monthly chain upgrades. Where we're able to deploy new features to the network while adding new node operators during this process as well. Uh, just a couple of key areas of focus this past year that, that I wanted to highlight are, are here. Uh, number one has been platform scalability. Uh, as we got more and more applications running on Flow and these applications uh, increase sometimes uh, very significantly in popularity, we recognized the need to maintain uh, extremely committed to ensuring that Flow is, is highly scalable uh, and is able to support whatever traffic uh, comes via these applications that are built on top of Flow. We've not only kept a scalability um, as, as a top priority of ours, but we, we put even, even more emphasis on it this past year as we've seen explosive popularity being attracted to our ecosystem applications. Scalability is something that, that, that we're addressing in almost every area of our protocol from node operations um, to cadence, which is our programming language and to, to network communication. We've been able to make significant progress on this this past year and, and get us to the point that that we are right now where we're, we're very comfortable in supporting uh, all the applications that are currently running on Flow. The next item, uh, which has been a key focus of ours this past year, has been uh, around protocol decentralization. Um, this past year, we, we, we took major significant steps towards uh, decentralizing our network, prioritizing features to, to further the network's resilience to potential Byzantine actors. And then lastly, uh, another key area of focus of ours um, was around uh, being a permissionless network. So alongside decentralization, um, we've also focused on, on really what is needed to, to create a truly permissionless network and how can we get there uh, as a blockchain. Uh, next, uh, the, the ecosystem. So um, the protocol of our blockchain is, is a key pillar that has really allowed the, the flourishing of our ecosystem um, this past year. At this point in time, uh, we currently have over 100 teams that are, are building on top of Flow. Uh, we have eight dApps that are currently live on mainnet and, and nearly 20 more that are preparing for, for deployment in the next in the next few months. We've uh, this past year, we've put put a lot, a lot of emphasis on making building on top of Flow, not only one that that makes sense, but is also a, an extremely easy process to do. Um, it, it's been truly amazing to, to see the community develop various types of applications and, and the success that has, has been able to come from them. Also this past year, we're able to launch um, what we call as, as Flowport, which is uh, our provided user interface as kind of like the, the portal into the Flow blockchain. Uh, this portal allows users to, to stake, to, to delegate, uh, and then to transfer Flow to other addresses and then to manage their existing uh, network positions as well. They could use our portal to also see the things like, like their rewards and then to take an action on them as well. So for example, being, to, being able to restake or redelegate uh, those rewards as well. Flowport was a, was a product um, that really laid the foundation for, for an easy to use user interface with uh, allowing anything that, that anyone could possibly want to do um, in interacting with the Flow blockchain. And um, this upcoming year, we're really looking forward to see how, how we can evolve this product and, and bring even more, uh, more features and enhancements to it. Uh, a few other key items from, from an ecosystem growth perspective uh, that, I, that I wanted to quickly touch on um, was, was number one, the support for FUSD, which is the first stable coin to launch on Flow and then to be supported by our ecosystem. Uh, the official launch of this is coming very, very soon. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And then number two, is uh, a successful integration with our custodial partners uh, of Kraken, Coinlist, Fanoa, and Blockdo, as they have all onboarded customers to, to flow at this time. Um, for our, our ecosystem to, to, to truly flourish and to get to the point that it's at, um, where we've been able to, to get uh, as many applications live on mainnet and then a, a, a really a lengthy backlog of applications that, that are soon to be launched uh, on mainnet, um, 
we, we really recognize the, the, the need um, to have developers be, be knowledgeable and, and really excited uh, about building on top of Flow. I mean, these, these developers are, are what bring the Flow blockchain to the world through their applications um, and really are a critical piece of, of our success as a blockchain. And for this reason, um, this past year, we, we created a new pillar, which, which we aptly named the Developer Experience Portal, um, with, with this really the goal to, to empower third-party developers uh, to launch applications on Flow. The, the goal was set out, the goal set that, that we set out with and, and what we were able to accomplish this past year is to, to have an improved developer onboarding uh, experience where we could reduce the time it takes to get an application um, from, from basically idea onto testnet and then, then onto mainnet. And how we did this, um, we did this by, by putting a really heavy focus on creating tools for these developers uh, that they can use um, and then ensuring that we have the proper educational material for, for easy and quick understanding. Uh, a couple of things that I want to expand on is, is the, the tools that, that, are, that we created um, were based on direct feedback from community members and the challenges that they ran into um, in developing and launching applications on Flow. For, uh, for our educational material, um, we put uh, heavy emphasis on creating examples and tutorials um, and, and other forms of practical educational content that aims to define a, a really clear and easy path from, from zero to mainnet. And then lastly, uh, we, we built the ability for a seamless web integration for DApps to register with, with our decentralized service or FCL, um, which gives them access to all the wallets that, that, that are integrated with FCL, which, which currently include Ledger, Blockdo, and Dapper. Um, all of this work has, has equated to, to nearly 2,000 developers uh, that are currently on our testnet at this, at this time. So again, I want to take a, a few minutes um, and just look into to the future uh, and touch on some of the things that, that, that we're currently working on right now and, and what's um, kind of what's coming and, and looking at the, the, the road ahead. Um, while we, we, we feel extremely good about what we've, uh, what we've been able to accomplish so far, uh, we <laughs> are very understanding that building a blockchain is a constantly evolving product. Um, and, and, and just keeping, keeping uh, evolution to it and, and building it up uh, to be more robust is, is something that, that we're heavily consistently focused on. So in terms of the protocol, um, we'll be introducing a, a formalized uh, epox process to the network this year that will allow node operators to, to join uh, and unstake themselves. And then for those, those joining and unstaking to be processed in an uh, automated fashion uh, by the protocol. Um, and then next, we're, we're going to continue to keep our, our sights on our, our three key pillars of scalability, um, again, keeping, keeping our platform uh, extremely scalable and being able to handle, you know, the, the, the most popular application that, that can be thrown at it, um, making uh, significant steps to, towards decentralization, uh, and then making flow to, to be a truly permissionless network. Uh, in terms of our ecosystem, uh, alongside of our, our deployment of, of FUSD, which was a stable coin, which I just mentioned, uh, will also support fiat on ramps uh, in order for our ecosystem to, to seamlessly integrate with the stable coin. Um, a couple of other items that, that we're going to be heavily focused on this year uh, are going to be uh, on a governance module uh, and then continuing to, to, to build a kind of like a, a robust uh, token model. Lastly, for our developer experience, um, we're, we're going to continue to, to really emphasize uh, enabling our community to, to thrive and build truly world-class applications in an expedited manner. Um, on top of that, we're, we're also supporting uh, many, many more applications that will be launching on Flow uh, in the upcoming months and, and even more so looking forward um, to, to the summer and then the end of part of this year. Um, so just be sure to be on the lookout for, for announcements from, from ourselves. Um, on the exciting applications that, that are going to be coming to you um, that are built on top of on top of Flow. Um, these are just a, a couple of, of high level items we, we are working on much, much, much more, um, which um, you all will, will see very soon uh, in, in your future. Uh, thank you all for your time. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm excited to be here. So thanks. Welcome, everyone. My name is Mason Nystrom. I'm a senior research analyst at Masari. And I'm happy to have you all here today 
at Consensus Foundation, this Q&A session with Flo. Having, uh, we're gonna have a great discussion and have some awesome questions lined up today. So everyone also please welcome Wiley Yu, who's head of marketing at Flo. Um, and Wiley, just to kind of set the stage, uh, Flo has really taken off over the past, I would say six months. Uh, obviously the flagship game NBA Top Shots has surpassed over you know, half a, half a billion in secondary sales. Uh, but I'd like to kind of talk about Flow more broadly and, and discuss kind of where you're heading. So in that regard, uh, Flow is kind of pitched as a, a scalable consumer application ready blockchain. Uh, to date, Ethereum is in the, you know, in the DeFi category, it has one to 2 million users. How do you see Flow getting to 1 million users? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you have, uh, for having me, uh, Mason, and you know, uh, great to be talking uh, on this stage. Um, yeah, interesting question. So, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, we actually surpassed one million users uh, on Flow a while back. I think in April, uh, and uh, yeah, we we probably did not uh, make a big announcement. So, you know, it was just like <laughs> an internal milestone. But uh, yeah, just to give some reference, you know, NBA Top Shot alone has a uh, uh, slightly over 1 million registered users and uh, 500,000 of them actually made the transaction. So um, that's, I, I guess, the stats uh, on the NBA, right? But on the Flow blockchain, we're seeing like, you know, uh, slightly over 1.5 million users to date uh, or accounts uh, more specifically. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that's uh, uh, also, uh, you know, uh, in addition to NBA Top Show, we're also seeing like a lot of momentum uh, on the overall flow ecosystem, as you mentioned, and uh, is uh, I think in the past you know, few months has been great seeing like a lot of project launching on flow and receiving like uh, you know experiencing great momentum. Um, just to give an example, right? Like for example, at the massively multiplayer game chain monster that had over thirty five hundred players just testing in that closed alpha, right? Um, so uh, they have not even launched their beta live yet, and uh, a Vive uh, NFT marketplace, which you know they did. Uh, a $2 million drop for single artists just like a few months back. They have over 20,000 users, uh, you know, in just like two or three months from their launch. And they blocked the wallet, uh, which is like one of the uh, main wallet on Flow. They have over 100,000 users. So we're seeing this uh, momentum uh, across the ecosystem, not just like, you know, the flagship in the top show uh, uh, application. And that's what excites me, uh, you know, personally. Awesome. And, uh, yeah. Congrats on a, on a million users. And I guess to kind of oh, like you. follow up that, that question. So you talked about NFT marketplaces, you talked about gaming. Uh, are there any other sectors or consumer type applications that you're uh, most excited to develop on Flow or that uh, you're most excited to, to see kind of to be developed by third-party developers? Um, yeah. Um, so regarding that, we are, we're currently seeing like many teams uh, across the uh, Flow ecosystem building. Uh, actually, uh, uh, applications across various sectors, uh, which I'm super grateful for, you know, the interest, also the passion uh, for being on top of Flow. Uh, we have the NBA Top Shot, uh, which, you know, has the sports, I guess, collectible category that's been proven to be pretty successful. And we have many applications of teams following that path, including the UFC that, you know, we're building internally, but also like MotoGP that recently had a drop on Flow, you know, by the Animoca brands. Uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, I can say like we have a uh, probably across all sectors, uh, uh, teams building application, uh, you know, or like uh, either launch or on a stage of building application across those sectors. For example, we have a project on the marketplaces side, both custodial and non-custodial, and then we have, <clears throat> sorry, we have a white label storefront for dedicated drops. Imagine the celebrities or teams, right? They want to have the Shopify style dedicated storefront. We have the music where we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, interesting innovation by right, being like tested right now. And also digital fashion, we have, you know, a project called New Uno, which is collaborating with some of the top high-end fashion houses, uh, doing like, you know, uh, 3D uh, wardrobe potentially. And then streaming side where, you know, um, some things are launched like uh, collectible uh, moments from like streamers favorite or most popular, uh, you know, clips. And then also gaming that I just mentioned and uh, uh, Chain Monster, but also Dark Country, they just finished their first ever uh, land drop, a uh, land sale drop on Flow that, uh, you know, was worth like probably more than half a million uh, successful drop uh, just a few days ago. So a lot of exciting, uh, you know, projects and uh, categories. Okay, very cool. 
And you, I mean, you mentioned music, you mentioned uh, a white label kind of platform for uh, Flow's own, like own drops. Uh, and obviously MBA Top Shot is a licensed uh, partnership with, with the MBA. And so how does uh, Dapper and, and Flow more broadly think about, you know, their own internal IP versus, you know, uh, third party IP and licensing? And how do you kind of see that progressing? Um, yeah, um, this is a great question, by the way. Uh, we, we get asked many times, and especially like even, even after we support uh, a lot of ecosystem projects, right, with a successful launch, they often like, you know, wonder like why we're willing to help them so much and instead of us capturing like, you know, all this value. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, to be honest, like, you know, uh, to be uh, very direct, like Dapper Studio, which is like the, uh, I guess, segment of the Dapper Labs that focuses on IP collaboration and you know building out like those experience like uh, and get top shot and then on UFC and others. Uh, it, there's a very limited amount of uh, application can build, uh, right? Like uh, all these uh, top IP holders, global brands, they require actually a pretty lengthy collaboration timeline. Like you know, imagine one to two years, and they require a lot of uh, uh, production and you know management, right? Uh, imagine like MBA top shot takes like you know 50 plus team members, so. Uh, on that regard, like, you know, the overall flow ecosystem is probably going to be hundred, if not thousand times bigger than anything like, you know, uh, in the Dapp, uh, you know, Dapper Studio can do alone. So that's why we're super, you know, uh, 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 interested in helping the ecosystem project succeed uh, and then give like, you know, any support possible uh, in terms of like ecosystem support, go to market strategy and also like uh, a global distribution. Um, and also, is, uh, I guess a fun fact is we are probably the largest source of referrals in terms of like IP brands and collaborators uh, to other projects. So, uh, you know, uh, maybe that's uh, something that people were not aware of. Yeah, very cool. I know you mentioned uh, Animoca Brands and they have a, a large war chest of, of IP as well. So it's uh, interesting to see you guys partnering with them. And, and I'm uh, excited to see how kind of that plays out over time because they have their hands into stuff like the Sandbox as well. So um you know I'm, I'm excited to see how this all cross cross collaborates over uh the long run um i'd like to kind of pivot a little i know that uh flow has is, is talked about launching fusd which is a, a stable coin that's going to be on flow and so i'd love to know what uh flow's kind of plans are to either develop like their own DeFi applications or what uh, do you think you know fusd will will facilitate in terms of other developers being able to build on top of flow mm -hmm. Um, so FUSD is a stable coin um, for the entire flow ecosystem um, issued and backed by uh, Prime Trust, um, a US regulated company. Um, so, you know, um, uh, they are the issuer and also that, uh, you know, guarantee the reserve, right? Um, and uh, once that's uh, currently is available in testnet where every developer can, you know, uh, test, play with it, integrate in the application. And then when it's available in mainnet, um, application marketplaces like wallet providers or fiat on ramp services will be able to leverage uh you know the stable coin to build uh, an even more streamlined onboarding experience for their users and i think that's the key uh idea behind fusd um it's less about a pure DeFi play from our perspective but more like another toolkit to allow ecosystem team to build like you know seamless user experience and to lower to lower the mainstream adoption barrier um, right. So ideally, you know, uh, we can see like that path going forward. Very cool. So just as a quick follow up, you you kind of uh, potentially see FUSD being utilized in existing flow uh, consumer applications and stuff like that. Yes, correct. Awesome. Uh, and then I kind of uh, just have uh, one last question because I know we're running up on time, but uh, attracting developers is one of, if not like the greatest uh, challenge, but also strength of open source software. And I would love to know kind of Flow's strategy and game plan to attract the best developers to its flat platform, because that's kind of a, a very long-term determinant of, you know, growth and, and ecosystem health. Uh, yeah, I cannot agree more. Um, there wouldn't be a Flow ecosystem without our, you know, amazing developers. Um, I'm, you know, I'm proud to say like we have a great product that we're ready to share, you know, with the broader developer community around the world. Um, so we are really seeing like a lot of developer activities across, uh, I guess, uh, within our community with over 3,000 uh, developers building or prototype on testnet before launching you know, on our mainnet. Um, 
but that compared to the global open source community is just like tiny drop, right? Um, so uh, we have spent probably like the last few months, right? Like a big portion of our effort improving our developer onboarding, developer tooling, and also documentation. So our next stage of uh, developer ecosystem growth is going to be focusing on uh, scalable education content, amplifying our global distribution and then building new developer engagement pipeline. So um, on that front, we are ramping up actually our internal hire to be able to tackle that challenge. And we're very excited, you know, to see the results in, in next few months or like coming year. Awesome, sounds exciting. Well, I think that's all the questions we have time for today. Uh, thanks everyone for watching. Thank you, Wiley. Thank you, uh, Consensus. And uh, look forward to chatting with all of you in the future. Yeah, thank you, Mason. And thank you everyone uh, for attending and joining us today. Bye everyone. Hey there, my name is Thank you, uh, Consensus, and uh, look forward to chatting with all of you in the future. Yeah, thank you, Mason, and thank you, everyone, uh, for attending and joining us today. Bye, everyone. Hey there, my name is... Thank you, uh, Consensus, and uh, look forward to chatting with all of you in the future. Yeah, thank you, Mason, and thank you, everyone, uh, for attending and joining us today. Bye, everyone. Hey there, my name is... we had to, to think through when we made this decision. Uh, you know, prior to becoming a federally chartered bank, we were a state chartered trust bank. And um, that in and of itself had a very high regulatory bar. But there were three main reasons that um, led us to, to this conclusion. And um, the first is state preemption. So as you know, uh, the financial system in our country is a real patchwork system of state regulations. And although we had our state charter, anytime we would want to take on a new client in another state, 
we would have to conduct an analysis. Now, sometimes that analysis um, would lead to the conclusion that we had reciprocity in that state, and so we needed to do nothing further. But sometimes we would need to seek additional licensure, or we would need to comply with other regulations. Sometimes we needed to comply with certain things that were, you know, potentially at odds with other states' regulations. And so it just became very difficult to operate in a system, you know, especially with with crypto that doesn't really recognize state borders. And um, having the federal charter gives us that state preemption where we can operate now in all 50 states and territories, provide ubiquitous services to all of our clients, not have to segregate people based on their residence. Uh, the second reason is that we are a now a unequivocal qualified custodian. So the SEC requires uh, registered investment advisors to custody their assets with qualified custodians. It's a defined term in the statute. And um, while certain state chartered trusts are qualified custodians, um, it's not as black letter as it is with just a federally chartered bank. Uh, the statute actually says like federally chartered bank is a qualified custodian. State chartered trusts have to meet other requirements that they're providing certain fiduciary services similar to federally chartered trusts, blah, blah, blah. So um, you have to conduct this additional analysis to make sure that you are versus now when we go to a client, we can just unequivocally say no analysis necessary, black letter, we're a qualified custodian. And then the third reason is to be um, regulated on a level that's peri pursue to our potential clients. So our uh, you know, premise is to work side by side with other federally chartered banks and provide subcustodial services. And so when they're bringing us in to provide those services, the fact that they don't have to worry about our regulatory structure, does it you know, meet their high burden with the OCC? Are they going to have to constantly be looking over our shoulder while we're providing these services? They know that we're held to the same standard, to the same bar that they are. And so it's just made those kind of conversations much easier. That's, that's yeah, a good I think, explanation, Georgia. I think, I think all that's correct. And, and, you know, I think this is absolutely an area where there's really kind of no one size fits all approach for an entity. Uh, when we've got, when we have a new company come come in you know we're asking questions about you know what market do you want to service do you institutional uh, retail what services do you want to provide uh you know are you looking to lend are you looking to issue assets are you are you looking to provide staking services um are you looking to provide settlement of securities for for, for example uh and you know depending on how those questions come out you know some and for some entities uh an occ trust bank may be appropriate uh for some of those entities you know they, they wind up going with uh you know state trust charters you know the the, the new york uh, regime, it's you know it, it, it predates um, uh, the the kind of crypto. Uh, you know, actually goes back goes back to the 1970s. So there's a, a rich body of law there stating what a uh, what a New York State trust company can and cannot do. Uh, you know, broker services, exchange services, lend, certain types of lending services, market market making services, uh, et, et cetera. Um, you know, Wyoming could be appropriate for, and it's depending on ultimately what services uh, they, they, they want to provide. So it's, you know, when people say, why would you want to go for a bank level charter? That can mean many different things that comes along, come along with own your own independent obligations, uh, your own kind of scope of services that we know uh, have been approved in the past and there's a roadmap for, but also kind of an understanding of what the potential legally scope of legally permissible services could be once you go back to the regulator and discuss kind of the operational and supervisory risk associated with that. I, I, I want to kick it over to Caitlin because, you know, Georgia mentioned that when you're regulated on the federal level, you don't have to get 50 different licenses. You don't have to get 50 different, um, uh, you know, sets of approvals. It's, you know, you know, it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of a kind of almost a one and done deal. Uh, you know, from your perspective in, in Wyoming, um, if you, you know, you know, uh, you know, what, what, what's the advantage of, of being regulated on, a, on the state level? Well, it's a huge advantage. First of all, the only type of bank that's available to the digital asset industry that is eligible to apply for a speedy bank. It is a depository institution and federal law requires depository institutions 
uh, only depository institutions to be eligible to apply. Um, so so uh, uh, Dana is absolutely right. It very much depends on the services that you want to provide. Uh, I understand why those who had state chartered trust companies previously would be interested in federal preemption by going for an OCC trust charter, but the OCC trust charters are not full banks. They are not authorized to accept US dollar deposits, unlike a Wyoming SPDI. So anyone who wants access to the Federal Reserve payment system has to go through the Wyoming SPDI route and it is a misnomer that there is not federal preemption. There actually is. There's something called the Regal Neal Act, which Mark, I know you came from <laughs> the banking world, so you know all about interstate banking. Uh, the Regal yes. Neal Act prohibits states from discriminating against other states' state chartered banks. So a Wyoming SPDI charter can get you into all 50 states. There are a couple of states that require an extra hoop to jump through. Uh, and uh, what's been going on behind the scenes is the state of Wyoming uh, Banking Commissioner Albert Forkner, who is the second longest serving banking commissioner in the United States. Uh, he has been quietly working out arrangements with those other states so that uh, those few states that have uh, the extra hoops. Uh, and a clarification. Uh you know, you, you use the word depository, but uh, but SPDIs, they're not FDIC insured, correct? That's right, yes. Yes, and the How reason is the FDIC wouldn't provide insurance to banks that were handling digital assets. So FDIC insurance isn't available to anyone in the industry right now. We understand the ice uh, is thawing, but it's not mm -hmm. it's not melted. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, and, I'd just uh, like to follow up on the um, access to the Fed rails, and yeah. Caitlin's exactly yeah. right. Like. There are, um, we do not have access to the Fed rails as a, as a trust bank, but that's not really part of our business model. And taking U.S. dollar deposits, again, not part of our business model. We're a crypto bank and we take crypto assets for our, you know, our clients are big, you know, sophisticated institutions. If they want to custody U.S. dollars, they already have a place to do it. So we are working on crypto rails. We are a crypto native institution. But I do understand if fiat currency is an important part of your business model, then it's true. Like no FDIC insurance, no Fed rails. Um, but again, it's just not something important to what we're up to. Yeah, I, I, I think that's exactly right. Oh. The, the, the important distinction there is that um, depository banks are a different model, as Georgia said, um, a different model from trust banks. Um, FDIC insurance, you know, you look at the reason that you have FDIC insurance in the process and in the system. And uh, much of the reason for that is that uh, it's to insure depository banks where loans go bad. And depository banks uh, you know, make loans. Um, they have fractional reserves and hold on to uh, you know, hold on to a, a, only a fraction of, of the deposits that they have, um, and the FDIC insurance comes in and uh, insures those uh, those deposits in order to uh, to protect those customers. Trust banks, on the other hand, um, are required to be 100% reserved and um, uh, hold all of the assets uh, in custody. So. Um, th th there's an important distinction there to uh, uh, to say that a trust bank, like Georgia said, uh, is different from a depository institution. It's the right model for a uh, a, a crypto uh, custody solution, and uh, we feel very comfortable and excited to be uh, to be not only a New York State trust bank, uh, but also a national trust bank. And Wyoming so SPDI charters, by law, are required to hold 100% reserve. That's definitely. Right. So I, I, I think this is all exactly right. I mean, there in, in that no one size fits all approach. It really is drilling down upon what services do you want to provide, and then finding the right model that le that lets you do it. Um, you know, having that that Fed access, which you'd still need to go through an added level of approval with the Fed to to, to get there, uh, doesn't necessarily make you know make make something better or or, or worse. Um, Sure. I'm not so sure about so, that, that, Dana, though, because if the if the Federal Reserve has approved you, it takes the last the last uh, regulatory risk off the table. Uh, the Federal Reserve has so far pretty much been silent on digital assets up until a few weeks ago when they released their payment system access principles. 
uh, it was they, they've been silent on on digital assets. And so one of the one of the interesting things that has happened in the last few days at the Federal Reserve is um, Governor Brainerd's keynote here at Consensus on Monday. She started talking about stable coins and getting them into the banking system. She's been pretty pretty clear about that for a while. Um, and then last week. Um, is still a regulatory risk for the industry. And so to the extent that that a bank gets Federal Reserve approval, it takes that big regulatory risk off the table. Re regulatory risk for the industry, I think, is different than I, th I think are two different things. I, I am, you know, I'm in agreement with you that, you know, if, if, if there is sign off uh, from the Federal Reserve, uh, over the industry uh, or certain aspects of the industry that is a good thing for the ecosystem um uh but you know if we're talking about you know do you have the right charter to service the customers that you want to service that's a to me a different question and also so, to be clear i mean we are members of the federal reserve we do not have access to the window but we're still members all all federal trust banks are members of the federal reserve that's so correct i, I want to possibly want to bring it to <laughs> I want to bring this to some some recent events here. So we have a new administration now. Um, you know the the uh, sort of special purpose uh, national charter that that was made available for for Anchorage and Paxos. Um, you know we've got Senator Sherrod Brown asking the OCC to reassess that. Uh, you know we've got a we've got a different controller now. Um, uh, you know, succeeding Brian Brooks, who will, will actually be on the program a little bit later. Uh, Brian Brooks had this very sort of ambitious agenda, um, and uh, we've had a change in administrations. So, you know, what, what's your response? Uh, particularly, I want to hear uh, from 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 uh, Georgia and Dan to uh, Se Senator Brown's comments, and um, you know, uh, you know, uh, what, what's what's the risk that the OCC walks back this charter? Georgia, you want to um, take that first? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Thanks, Dan. Um, so yeah, I want to just have one point of clarification. So we um, did not apply and did not receive any sort of special purpose charter. We did not receive a de novo charter. We did not receive a novel charter. We have a very plain vanilla conversion from a state chartered trust to a federally chartered trust bank charter. Um, with a lot of historical precedent. So we're not relying on any of the recent guidance that was you know, set forth uh, by uh, the OCC. And we're certainly not relying on any of these um, novel charters. Um, the other point is that while our charter was initially conditional, we have since met all conditions and our charter is no longer conditional, we are, we are operating. Um, also, we have been operating since the time of conversion as a national trust bank. So um, we're not, you know, waiting in order to get some form of approval to service our customers. We've had a seamless operation since day one. Um, also, to, to Mr. Brown's concerns about some of the um, types of services that he's concerned with, predatory lending and, and you know, strain on the the overall financial system. Again, those are not activities that we conduct. So, um, you know, I just want to be clear that those are not concerns that really, um, you know, are shared by us or, or, you know, that would be promulgated by by us and our activities. And, and then I guess, finally, um, you know, Anchorage Digital really focuses on institutional clients and, you know, sophisticated clients. And I think a lot of his concern is really more at the retail level. And so, um, you know, I'm looking forward, frankly, to having discussions with his office and kind of clarifying and distinguishing our business model from, I think, some of the other sorts of um, players that he's concerned about. Yeah, I, I, I would echo much of that. I mean, I, I think that uh, the important thing to remember here is um, it's it's appropriate for a new administration and a new acting controller to come in and review things and review uh, the decision making that the agency has done and to uh, uh, make sure that everything was done in a, uh, a, a robust and appropriate fashion. Um, we're confident that uh, when the acting controller uh, takes a look and, and interviews his staff and uh, and looks at the, the the very comprehensive and professional uh, job that the OCC did 
in, uh, in, in reviewing Paxos's application for a national trust bank uh, and reviewing our business plan and approving it. Um, that they'll see that, that, that he'll see that it was a, uh, um, a really strong process and that uh, the application is entirely meritorious. Um, I also think that uh, it's appropriate for Congress to oversee that process and you know, also welcome the engagement with Senator Brown um, and think that it's appropriate for him to be pushing the OCC to be taking a closer look at these things, especially at the time of a new administration. Um, it, you know, Paxos in its history um, it was, has always been committed to, uh, to, to doing things within the regulatory process, uh, always been committed to asking for permission rather than forgiveness. In 2015, we became the first uh, trust company in the digital asset space when we were uh, pr approved for a trust charter by the New York Department of Financial Services. We're keeping that trust charter. We've built a tremendous relationship with the New York DFS over the past six years, and uh, we'll continue operating out of that even while our application with the uh, our final application with the OCC is pending. Um, and uh, and we look forward to uh, to continuing to work with the OCC um, both on this review and in getting to final approval so that we can operate both as a uh, a trusted trust company at the state level and at the national level. Mark, one of the important things to add about that. Oh, Mark, oh. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Caitlin. Uh, one of the important things to add, though, is that even though the OCC Trust Bank Charter has been around for a long time. Brian Brooks made a major change to it that, as you know, Mark, the banking industry has uh, has very loudly objected to, um, which is right before the inauguration in January, uh, the OCC changed its policy with regard to chartering trust banks so that non fiduciaries could get a trust bank charter. It used to be under the under decades of practice that the OCC trust bank charter was only granted to fiduciary trust companies. And the OCC has in its policy handbook a statement that custody is not a fiduciary activity. And so if, if the bank is only engaged in custody services or primarily engaged in custody services, historically it would not have been eligible for a trust charter. Uh, this is one of the things that the um, Biden administration has indicated that is re it is reviewing. And I think there's a decent chance that that does end up in litigation with the banking industry. You saw the big objections that were launched by the uh, banking industry against that very change, which was not subjected to the traditional public comment period. And it happened three days before uh, the first charter was granted under that, under those new rules. I think we can all agree. Sorry, I just have a quick point of clarification. Fortunately okay. for us, um, we did not have to rely on that guidance with respect to fiduciary because both under South Dakota law, we were operating as a fiduciary and pursuant to federal law, we operate as a fiduciary. So um, both before and after we, we provide services that are deemed to be fiduciary services under both uh, scopes. I, I, yeah, I just want to jump in. I, I just want to jump in on that because before before it gets modeled, I think that that's a really important point because that same language that Caitlin is, is pointing to also discusses: Are you a fiduciary if you're converting? Also, are you also a fiduciary under your home state law? So that that's that's what a, a occurred a, occurred uh, with. with uh, Anchorage, it was not relying upon the, you know some some sort of new level of guidance, uh, and I think things often get muddled when we're talking about uh, you know not using kind of like the, the precise names for the various licenses. So like to 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 George's point, it, this is uh, you know a trust bank is a it is a type of entity that is allowed for and exists under uh, uh, un under the National Banking Act. There is a history for entities that are providing fiduciary services at the state level to convert. Uh, to an OCC trust bank, we saw that with the ICE Trust. We saw that with with grandmothers, uh, and you know the, the states uh, will call custody uh, uh, a fiduciary service, uh, and under existing law that predates that guidance, um, the, the OCC kind of looks to that that state level interpretation. Guys, I want to zoom out sorry, the lens a little bit. Sorry, sorry, Mark. Let me just respond quickly to uh, to Caitlin's point as well because I think it's an important one. Um, you know, I, I would add that uh, that uh, Paxos's uh, preliminary conditional approval was approved by the, uh, the, the the longtime professional staff at the OCC uh, after Brian Brooks had left, um, and uh, it, it, you know who are fully on board and understand the 
um, changing dynamics. I think we would also all agree that um, the changing dynamics of the financial system are appropriate. The changing regulation, whether it's at the OCC or um, or or in Wyoming, uh, is, is is appropriate, and um, that the financial system is changing. There should be new guardrails to ad adapt to the new financial system. Um, and you know what we all really want is to be able to project to our customers and to the market uh, trustworthiness, um, which is exactly what Paxis has been trying to uh, 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 to establish and to convey to the market since its founding. That's a perfect segue to uh, okay. what I wanted to get into, which is uh, the, the whole question of systemic risk. Crypto Leave it to is Dan. New. <laughs> crypto, crypto is new. You know, crypto is, you know, Bitcoin's only a little bit more than 10 years old. Um, uh, the, the whole ecosystem is very complex. Uh, and as we know, uh, it's very volatile. Um, and so that's raising concerns about, uh, you know, the risk to the, to the broader financial system if we allow, um, you know, banks, even in sort of very limited ways, uh, to be to, to be touching this stuff, or at least that that that's what you hear. So I, I'd like to hear everyone's thoughts on, um, you know, on 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 this question. I mean, if, you know, if if you think about, you know, back, you know, for for decades, you know, securities and banking were separated uh, after after the Great Depression because it was just seen that you had to wall off banking from this sort of riskier activity of, 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 uh, of securities trading. Those uh, barriers were sort of gradually removed um, starting in the 80s um, and then, you know, you know, done away with in the late 90s. And then we had, you know, th obviously this is a, a bit simplistic to say it's cause and effect, but many people believe that that is at least a contributing factor to the financial crisis. So, you know, what, what, what's the, what is the level of systemic risk here and, and how do you respond to those concerns? We'll start with Caitlin. Well, the level of systemic risk is, uh, it, it should be zero because no one should ever be left. Oh, we just lost Caitlin. She'll be back. Um, uh, Georgia, why don't you take it on while we wait for Caitlin to come back? Sure. Um, so I think that, um, again, this really just goes back to the specific products and services that are being provided by any given institution. I think all of us are in this industry because we want to build a better financial system that is more safe, more secure. Um, and I think giving people more options as to how to, you know, what types of assets to hold, what types of assets to transact with, the, t the ways that they can transact with those assets is a way to build strength. Um, and so I think fundamentally, that's what we're all here trying to do. Um, with respect to Anchorage Digital and our business, um, kind of what Caitlin said, like systemic risk should be zero. I feel that our business risk has zero systemic, uh, is, is zero systemic because um, we're not engaging in those kind of riskier behaviors. We're not taking deposits and lending them. We're not, you know, mismatching maturities. We're not uh, structuring products that, you know, nobody really knows the outcome of. And we do, you know, everything that we do is, as you know, highly regulated. We have, you know, capital requirements that we have to maintain. We don't take these assets on our balance sheet. And um, I think as long as we put these kind of procedures in place, we're going to minimize that systemic risk. And as I noted before, by building this other element to the overall financial structure, we're going to make it more safe and secure. Yeah, I think that's right. Sorry, volatility, sorry, sorry. In industry is, 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 volatility should not be equated with uh, uh, with safety and soundness. Um, you know, the prices go up and down, but the the fundamentals of the market are strong. And I think the more we see uh, institutional players come into the market, and uh, you know, and and um, a, a deeper liquidity in all of these markets, we're going to see more price stability. But we're also going to see more uh, maturity. You know, the the, the market is. Uh, the crypto market is new, but it's not that new. Uh, Dana and I were at the New York Department of Financial Services uh, in 2015 at the time of the uh, issuance of the, the the first in the nation bit license. And at that time, um, you know, we as regulators didn't know anything about um, uh, you know about what were the risks here, who were the um, more reliable players, who are the less reliable players, and there were some. Uh, as a result, the uh, the first in the nation regulation uh, you know put around put some tight guardrails in place. Um, now, I think, you know, we're knowing and we're seeing uh, both from the DFS side and from other regulators 
um, a, a you know more more mature and more developed regulation and more thoughtful because we know what the risks are. We know who are the, who are the stronger players. Uh, we know how to regulate this space, and that's going to lead to uh, uh, the ability for the space to really grow much faster. I, I think that's all exactly right. I mean, these are these are services, you know, one that largely should be regulated, um, and you know, I, I believe that there is a kind of a learning that happens on both sides with you know entities stepping into the space, learning what it means to be a regulated entity, learning what it means um, to provide regulated financial services. On the same t on the same side, it, it's uh, it, it's not going away. So it is important, I think, for the regulators also to learn. Uh, and you don't learn by regulating one entity or two entities. You learn by seeing how the ecosystem operates um, and then understanding kind of what the systemic risks are and working in, in concert with industry. Caitlin, you want to finish your thought from earlier? Sorry about that. I don't know what happened, uh, but, yeah, uh, no but yes, yeah, no. Uh, and this is exactly why the Wyoming SPDI charter is set up to be a non-lending bank. So, so the Wyoming SPDIs are basically custody banks. Think about um, an analog would be State Street or uh, Bank of New York, Northern Trust. They have giant trust businesses that are very similar to a state charter trust bank or an OCC trust bank. But in addition, they can take US dollar deposits and they're prohibited from lending those US dollar deposits. So it's 100% reserved on either side, uh, both the, the customer dollar deposits as well as the trust business. But one of the things that's fascinating about it is that the Wyoming SPDIs have four times the capital requirements banks and many multiples. In some states, you can get a trust charter for $500,000 of capital. So the, the capital requirement is massively different. Um, and if you think about that, because the, the, the capital model is the same as the models that apply, the capital requirements that apply to banks nationally, we are massively overcapitalized relative to a traditional bank. And, uh, and, and so, yes, absolutely, there's concern about leverage. And as long as you don't have backdoor ways for leverage to, to, to get in to the way you manage the bank through um, delayed settlement of transactions or um, the, the, the bank being willing to settle a digital asset trade first instead of second. So you have a, you're not pre-funding all of your transactions. There are backdoor ways leverage can, can get in and all of those are locked down here. So what we have here is both in the OCC trust banks example, as well as the Wyoming Speedy Bank's examples, we have banks that are designed not to be leveraged um, and then the Wyoming Speedy Banks are four times the, the capital requirement of the OCC trust banks. Caitlin, I'm going to ask you an admittedly rude question. Uh, and this is because uh, someone asked <laughs> someone asked me this and I thought uh, I thought it, we should, it should we should at least talk it through. Uh, and at the risk of sounding like a coastal elite, does, uh, <laughs> does a state like Wyoming have the sophistication to regulate such a new and complex and um, kind of uncharted waters? Uh, space like crypto? Yes, and I, I understand why you're asking that question. It's the same question that I'm sure the bank regulators asked of the state of South Dakota when South Dakota took over the credit card business in the early 1980s. Most folks don't even understand that New York is not the state with the highest dollar value of banking assets in the United States. It's South Dakota because that's where the credit card companies are. Uh, but specifically, Wyoming walked before it ran. And, and again, this is one of the things that the um, Biden administration's um, pronouncements with regard to reviewing what the OCC did at the end of the Trump administration is so interesting because Wyoming laid a really solid foundation first and worked with the Federal Reserve to do that over a three year period and did so with the complete support of the Wyoming banking commissioner who, as I mentioned, is the second longest serving commissioner. So he's former past president of, um, of the Conference of State Bank Supervisors, very, very long tenured because in Wyoming, the banking commissioner position is not a political appointment. It's a, it's, it's a career um, service appointment, a, a career service job. And so what, what we did was very methodically change the property law and the commercial law to give clarity on how you get title to a digital asset and what, it, what the digital asset is under commercial law. We've actually led in effect the Uniform Law Commission who is now two years later after initially criticizing Wyoming, uh, they're, they're now in uh, proposing essentially uh, the two major prongs of the Wyoming digital asset commercial law. Okay, but those are foundational things that no other state has done. And then once Wyoming did that, then, then it enacted the, the charter for the SPDI 
Once you get a charter enacted, you then need rules. And once you get your rules put out for public comment, then you need the, the bank supervisors to know what to supervise. I happen to know that none of the other states outside of New York have examined their state charter trust companies that handle digital assets. And the reason is they don't even know what questions to ask. And so it's fascinating because Wyoming has had so much inbound looking for the supervisor exam manual, which it works with Promontory uh, Financial Services uh, to, to provide. It's a 750 page manual and the Federal Reserve was right there all along um, as Wyoming was drafting that manual, providing comments on it. Uh, and so, so Wyoming is actually the first state and, and actually the only regulator in the United States that has a supervisory exam program for digital assets, has trained its examiners and has rules outstanding that were put out for public comment on uh, banks that touch digital assets. Other states and the OCC will no doubt catch up. That's, that's, this is a given. Um, the, the only question is when, and, and frankly, Wyoming has led the way and, um, and, and other states and the OCC are copying it. The OCC called Wyoming for its supervisory exam manual. That speaks volumes about uh, how the OCC is thinking about what Wyoming did. Does this, uh, does this manual, does it mention things like, like Faraday cages and um, uh, you know, uh, private key, you know, private keys and things like that. It does actually. And in fact, actually, there's a lot of detail in Wyoming's digital asset rules on those exact requirements on how, um, and how to, to, to securely store private keys. Uh, there's also the, the very first rules that I'm aware of globally, not just in the United States on, on investor protections. Well, there was a consumer advocate who was part of the Wyoming rulemaking process. And, uh, and, and, and the, the default is that any fork and airdrop proceed uh, that comes into a custodian is by definition, it belongs to the customer, not the, not the trust company or the bank. Um, and so there's a lot of, of detail around exactly how that's supposed to be done. And um, it, there's no such detail anywhere else in the world for that. Well, this is this is fascinating. I think we could keep going on for another hour, but I'm afraid we're out of time. So I want to thank Caitlin, Georgia, Dan, and Dana. This is a great conversation. Uh, I learned a lot, uh, and uh, so thank you for joining us. So um, I'm going to uh, get back with Nate. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Thank you. thank you, Nate. What were oh, your my. takeaways from that conversation? Um, takeaways is that banking is important um, and that banking regulation uh, is important and it's uh, this industry trying to take this very na nascent asset class and meld it with the traditional um, financial system um, requires a take at you know a look at uh, very old laws as well as you know recent ones um, uh, and so it's, it's interesting especially um, to kind of see the trade-offs um, that you make depending on what kind of business model that you want um, as, a, as a bank uh, that's uh, or as a firm that's interested in uh, working with uh, you know cryptocurrency um, companies but um, what I thought that was very interesting um, so I think now we we're up next with a uh, with a quick break um, but stay with us We'll be back soon.
And we're back. And uh, coming up right now, we have a conversation uh, between two people who should be very well known to the crypto audience. We've got uh, Jeremy Allaire, CEO of Circle, and the legendary NLW. So I think these men need no introduction. Jeremy, how are you doing? Good to see you again. Hey, great to see you. So I'm super excited for this conversation. You know, I, I feel like one of the things that's challenging about bull markets is that there's so much that's like this close to our faces constantly in terms of price action and the latest, you know, news that caused said price action that it's almost hard to understand or notice or pull ourselves out to see these sort of larger seismic shifts happening underneath us. And I think a lot of what we want to talk about today, both around CBDCs and stable coins, the relationship between them, are experiencing those major, you know, significant changes all around us, even as this sort of nominal bull market and, you know, and and kind of retracements and all these sort of things is happening around us. So super excited for this conversation. And I thought maybe let's just kick off by talking about kind of for, for those who haven't been paying attention as much or haven't been keeping track, you know, what we've been seeing on, let's start, I guess, with this, the CBDC front this year, you know, what have been the moves from China? What have been the moves from the US? What have been the moves from the rest of the world? And we can kind of dive in anywhere and just let the conversation flow as it does. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, at a high level, obviously, China is focused on ensuring that the government maintains control over electronic money um, because over the last 10 years, two private companies, um, Alipay and Tencent, you know, control electronic money for a billion people. And so I think that, you know, there's a, 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 a need for the state owned banking sector um, to have some competitive alternative. Uh, to to Alipay and and WeChat Pay, um, and and so that that's sort of I think at the core of what we're seeing there. Um, th th there's a lot more to that, obviously, as well. But I think the strategic imperative has really been around uh, uh, having a, a a an alternative. Um, in, in some ways, it's not dissimilar from the longstanding you know desire for something like Fed now. This idea of yeah, the government could run a real-time payment system. It doesn't have to be run by um, private sector actors, you know. So, but that, that's that's one important framing. I mean, in terms of CBDC activity in the United States, I mean, there's some academic research that's going on, and I think there may be some research papers that are published. But, it, but there's not actually anything being built uh, in the United States, um, nor do I think there really ultimately should be. But um, I think what's really happening is this extraordinary growth in public blockchains, crypto economic systems, digital currency models, the rise of digital commodity monies, the rise of stable coins. And all of this is, is happening in a very organic bottom up way in the same way that the internet itself grew. And that's causing, um, governments, policymakers to ask a lot of questions um, and, and think about what, what, what the future might hold. And so while you have, I think, you know, so, so to some degree, you know, a lot of talk about this, um, you know, in, in, in most parts of the world, it is pretty much limited to research at this point. So I want to actually unpack this a little bit because I know that one of the positions that you guys have started to articulate through blog posts, essays, conversations that you've had is the idea of kind of the wrongheadedness of the argument that we should be trying to out China China when it comes to CBDCs, that we should be thinking in pretty fundamentally different terms. And I want to spend just a little time about kind of unpacking both sides of that because I think it's a really important different way of looking at this conversation. And I guess first, you know, so you kind of made the point that when it comes to China's CBDC efforts, 
a lot of their focus, it seems over the past six months, especially, but even longer, has been to rein in the power of the private fintech companies that aren't touching crypto, by the way. These are mobile kind of, sure. uh, you know, first companies that have been, um, you know, previous to that, were taking on a bigger and bigger portion of bank-like activity without being regulated as such. Uh, China has been cracking down on them. Now we're seeing perhaps a shift of focus over to another area of private money type things in terms of their focus on crypto. Um, I guess, you know, if you had to kind of sum up how uh, China's approach, the approach that maybe we shouldn't be taking, how would you do so? And then I guess maybe as part of that, because I think it would be helpful context, how do you view their ambition? How much is it just a domestic focus on stability and they want to be able to control their system internally versus larger global aspirations? And where do those lines get drawn, if, if at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, just just a, a, at a very high level, clearly, um, we're seeing growth in the importance of the you know RMB, the yuan, um, and, uh, and 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 that's obviously sort of strategically important economically as the Chinese economy becomes the largest economy in the world, um, and that that shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, if you look at the arc of, of of history in terms of growth of economies and currencies and so on, that 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 shouldn't be a surprise and. Um, I think, you know, similarly, um, you know, the, the the longstanding goals of opening up the capital account, enabling more convertibility, you're even seeing in, in recent days, recent weeks, really, really a lot of strength in the yuan, more capital that wants to come into Chinese uh, sovereign uh, debt and, instead of U.S. treasuries. Um, you're, you're seeing... Um, more indicators that the capital account might be opened. All, all of these are indicative of a likely transformation in terms of the openness of, of the Chinese financial system. And of course, the corollary is that the growth in the use of, of RMB. And so a, you know, I, I think a, a modern um, you know, internet-based distribution model makes a lot of sense in that context. Um, so I think there's an interesting question around um, how that will interplay with public blockchains. And I think that'll be a really fascinating area. I think there's a tremendous opportunity for fiat digital currencies operating on public blockchains, the benefits of these, these open networks, the benefits of decentralized finance, of programmability, of, of really having a common infrastructure that the whole world can connect to and build on top of. And so I, I would expect over time to see Perhaps it's through offshore markets initially, um, RMB stable coins, um, you know, are are done in, in collaboration with private sector actors. Um, so I, 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 you know, there's a lot lot more to say there and a lot more to to, to talk about there. Um, but th that's a, a little bit of of their perspective here. I mean, um, on the on the topic of um, you know you know thinking about you know, what should the United States or, or, or Europe or Japan or any developed economy or emerging market, any, anyone in the world, how to think about this problem space. You know, our view is that what has made the, the Western free market, uh, you know, system and, and democratic system work so effectively has been embracing openness, embracing free market competition, embracing um, the, 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 the adoption of, of open intellectual property, um, you know, the, the, the sort of way in which most of the world embraced the internet itself as an open network, as a permissionless network where pe anyone could connect, that challenged really profound notions of government supervision over communications, over commerce, uh, uh, over a number of things. And I think that open model and a model that was really led through um, American, European technology innovation, that's served the world pretty well. And I think it's, it's really interesting that there's a real, as we know, in both the political and economic systems right now in the United States and in other parts of the world, including Europe, there is this reversion to nationalism that has been going on. And I think um, 
that you know there there's uh, on on both sides of the aisle in the United States a reversion to nationalism, and I think that nationalism, that reversion to nationalism, um, is is in part also a response to China, uh, which is a highly nationalist country. Um, but again, this is the don't try and out China China. The the United States should be embracing models of innovation that are based on the fundamental principles that have made uh, the, the, the Western democratic and free market system flourish, including over the past 30 years, in particular, innovation on top of, uh, of, the, of the internet. And, and frankly, the history of electronic money innovation in the world and in the West is one of private sector actors building open technology standards that are interoperable, coming up with consortium models, and the like, whether that's the international wire transfer system or the, what we know as electronic money for most people, which is credit cards or you know these, these kinds of things, or even Apple Pay. Um, these innovations weren't because the Federal Reserve decided to you know, start an R&D department and, and build these things. And what's happening in the stablecoin space right now is extraordinary. It's not just stablecoins, it's stablecoins, public chain infrastructure, um, and and what is made possible through through de decentralized finance, this composition of things is moving with incredible velocity of innovation. That's a huge thing that that the United States government should be harnessing. Um, and 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 frankly, I mean, you know, research is great, but you know, people are shipping code, and there's thousands and thousands of companies around the world building on this. And so that's a wonderful thing that should be tapped. Uh, and, and invested in and supported, just like you know, the space race isn't being won by NASA, it's being won by incredible private companies with support of the federal government. Uh, electric cars, uh, artificial intelligence, it's not that there's a bunch of software development and R&D happening at the federal government, they're supporting these as strategically important industries. That's how the United States government should be looking at crypto, looking at blockchain, looking at stable coins, looking at crypto banking, it needs to look at this as this is the future of the global economic system, and we ought to be supportive of its really mature, rapid uh, commercial development. So one of the really salient points from that, and it's a point that I've heard you make before, is that the way that we interact with the traditional finance system is largely the story of you know, private sector innovations harnessed through a, a public lens and a, and a kind of a public bureaucracy that that makes them, you know, uh, sort of formalized, right? Um, and that in some ways, it's actually, it would be going the opposite direction to assume that this new sort of technology design, even if, quote unquote, administered by the Fed or, or someone would come strictly from the Fed. It's actually the total opposite of how things have developed in the past. I mean, can you just speak a little bit more to that? Because it's, I, I think I want to just point, make the make the point that this is the norm is actually public private partnerships, not just, you know, the, the, the public sector. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, 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 the systemically important payment infrastructures in the world are consortiums of private sector actors who are building and evolving technology standards and interoperability and getting a broad array, thousands of different financial institutions and market participants to adopt them, whether that's the way that money moves uh, around internationally, uh, whether that's um, you know the 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 the, the clearinghouse, uh, whether that's card networks um, and, and many other innovations like card networks, um, it, you know, a, a, as well as like deeper things like people don't realize like the way in which currencies. And liquidity on currencies happen are through these like systemically important infrastructures like CLS, which is you know probably the biggest bank that no one's heard of, which handles trillions of dollars a day of of, of the core transactions uh, b between the major currencies of the world. That's a you know a systemically important utility, uh, but it's not run by the government. It, it it's 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 run through a consortium of seventy of the most important financial institutions in the world. And it has supervisory relationships with like 23 central banks. And so I think, and, and this is, I'll, I'll, I want to I want to step back a little bit from just focusing on, on stable coins, but more generally, um, you know, I, I actually find it very encouraging that the Federal Reserve, U.S. Treasury, FDIC, these core banking regulators want to get together and think about crypto banking. What does it look like? What does it mean? Um, there are going to be tremendous 
great new national financial institutions and, and international financial institutions that are built from the ground up around crypto. So the right response is, okay, how do we think about that from a, from a su supervisory risk management perspective? Um, and and that's, a, that's the opportunity for public-private collaboration. And you know, allowing this particular form of, of innovation to grow and flourish and, and be supported, um, uh, but, but also realizing that, yeah, there, there probably are going to be various forms of, of national licensing that are, would emerge. I mean, it's, it's remarkable to me that in the United States, there is no national digital banking type charter. I mean, if you go to UK, if you go to, uh, you know, you know, markets like Singapore and Hong Kong and China, which has digital banking charters, um, you know, the United States has been incredibly slow and there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, but what the United States should be doing is, is embracing fintech innovators. And I think em embracing this more fundamental infrastructure in terms of crypt crypto economic systems uh, that, that get to the core of how the financial system and economic system operates and em embracing those as national treasures uh, that should be supported and invested in. Do you think there's a moment, you know, we're kind of at this interesting inflection point. We have a new administration, a whole new set of people who have come in, uh, who have perhaps different experiences, different perspectives on these things. Some who even have experience in the crypto industry. We have um, this potential shift uh, in the conversation around other parts of the crypto industry, like mining and hash power, right? You've got, saw the Bitcoin mining council, you know, uh, emerge last week, right? So there's a, this whole different conversation where, you know, I guess the question is, is there an opportunity for the US to throw out its priors to some extent or the way that we've talked about the crypto industry? Like, is this the right moment for, for them to be doing that? And I guess maybe to, to make it less, uh, you know, theoretical or less hopeful and more concrete, are you seeing any signs of a different type of thinking with this new administration, with the people who are coming into regulatory power now? I mean, I, you know, I, I think at a high level, there's some really, really positive things that are happening. I think just in general, as this technology has advanced and it continues to accelerate its advancement, so many more policymakers, regulators, career civil servants are just, they're, they're, they're much more um, engaged, educated. They're, it's just the, the, the level of dialogue, the level of education around these topics is so much stronger than it's ever been. And, and that's, that's important. And that's independent of left or right, Democrat, Republican, what administration, that's just like, that is happening. That it's the, the growing awareness and, and understanding is, is there. And so that's just a really powerful and important thing. Um, I think secondly, um, we're starting to see an understanding from a number of different areas of government that, and a belief that th this is actually strategically important. It's competitively and strategically important. What happens with how the United States um, treats blockchain infrastructure, public blockchain infrastructure, the, the innovations that are happening around it, that it's actually strategically important. Um, and not just, uh, you know, how, how do we rein in this thing over here or that? So I, I actually think the debate is evolving. The understanding is evolving. And I, I view that as also very encouraging. And that's against a bigger backdrop. Uh, and the bigger backdrop is a an awareness that there are these strategically important technology sectors that crucially need significant public-private uh, collaboration. And those, have, you know, many of those have been articulated by the Biden administration. I think it's notable that in the first articulation of that, blockchain was not included, but it is included in China's most strategic and important uh, technology initiatives. I think that's changing. I think people are waking up to that here. And I think it starts at the national security and economic level of thinking. Uh, and then it works its way. It works its way down. And so I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged. And I think there's a lot of extraordinarily bright people in the federal government who want to work with um, the private sector, the open source community, academic communities, and, and, and understand that this is, uh, you know, this has, you know, potential for very, very dramatic and positive uh, societal and economic um, you know, consequences. 
I know that when you kind of survey uh, what's happened over the last three to six months, call it, you're not thinking in terms of just, you know, random spot prices or even things kind of, you know, first, first order statistics, like the massive growth of stable coins, you're thinking more on like advancements in infrastructure. And so I'd love to hear just a little bit more about what some of those things, subaltern things are, the things happening just under the surface that are equally as significant or even more significant for the long term than just those high level numbers, like, uh, you know, 20 billion uh, USDC now in circulation and things like that. It's 22, but who's counting? I'm two days late. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, look, I, I, I think there, there's a lot. I mean, actually, the, the, the policy and regulatory stuff is actually one of those things when you zoom out and you look at it, it's like, holy cow. Like I, I was um, I was just in a slack before this and, 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 and talking with one of my colleagues about you know, um, uh, various uh, congressional and Senate testimonies on these topics that have happened over the years. And, you know, the, the first time I testified to the Senate was in November of, uh, of, of 2013. It was just after the Silk Road had been, you know, kind of taken down by the FBI. And, and, and there was the, the Homeland Security Committee called this hearing and it was going to have, you know, had the head of FinCEN, had the head of Secret Service, Jared Brito, uh, you know, w w w was there. Um, and, and you know, it was people were were wondering like, oh my God, is this it? Is this going to be you know the end of this uh, kind of kind of thing? And but like there had been like zero attention on these things, zero attention. And this was actually the first actual public hearing, and it was extraordinary. And what was notable is you know at the time those those agency leaders, you know, the FinCEN head and the Secret Service head said this technology has great promise, and. Um, and, and actually, the day of that testimony, you can go back in time, that was the peak of the 2013 bull market rally, because it was like, OK, this is the, the federal government. And there were there were uh, contributed uh, statements from the head of the SEC, the head of the Federal Reserve, you know, uh, all, all these folks saying this technology holds a lot of promise. So that was a moment in time when, you know, there was nothing on the regulatory side. Now, zoom forward and, you know, walk into the beginning of this year and you've got you know, the U.S. Treasury Department issuing guidelines for how banks can adopt stable coins as a fundamental payment infrastructure in the United States on par with card networks, the ACH networks and the like. That's incredible. You have the OCC issuing charters to crypto banks. Uh, you, you, know, you have all of these major regulatory agencies having created supporting structures around digital assets, digital asset commodities. Look, there's a lot more to be done. But it's extraordinary how far we've come. And, and that's that's a backdrop, and it relates to the first conversation we were having, and, and it's important. I think the second, though, is, you know, I, I look at this over kind of a, the long arc of the maturation of the fundamental technologies. And again, we're, you know, kind of zooming out from, you know, wh when I first got involved eight or nine years ago, you, you know, the technology is extremely limited. But now you've got third generation blockchains that can deliver hundreds of thousands of transactions per second with settlement finality and, you know, milliseconds uh, with incredible economics. That's dramatic. And you have this incredible growth in actual programmable money happening with, 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 with DeFi. Um, and you're seeing so much incredible, incredible intellectual property generation happening at that infrastructure level to the point where you can see how, everything from, from DeFi markets to core blockchain infrastructure, it's sort of on track to be able to support billions of users in the next two to three years. And so that's really important for everyone to be realizing is those platforms are maturing, the capabilities are maturing, and we're really in the early stages of what entrepreneurs and developers and creators are gonna build on top of that. And so th that's what I'm paying attention to. And, and when, when people ask me, you know, well, you know, how much USDC do you think will be in circulation in two years or how much is how much payment activity is going to be changed by this? I try and point out those kinds of of, of changes that are underway, um, because you, when you get anchored in those and you and you and you step back and look at those, you realize that, um, you know, we, we are we're really on the cusp of, of global scale usage on this in the next uh, couple of years. And do you think, I mean, I guess, you know, my, my, my final question maybe is how you see in the immediate term that evolving? What are the use cases that are most likely to drive things in the next few months? And I guess maybe just to tie into it, one of the things that we've talked about previously is how 
this year we've also got even the you know the some of the first embers of real mainstream usage in the world of nfts which is powered by the shared infrastructure but which is in some ways you know matured to a place where it doesn't even need to call it out and talk about the technology underpinning it so yeah. I, i'm interested to see kind of how you see that through line and and what you see coming down the pipeline next yeah i mean there, there's a lot of things and i know we only have a little time i i would just say um you know people talk about web3 and and these sort of um consumer scale applications that can be built on these public chains. A NFT markets are, are an example of that, you know, uh, sort of the, the kind of, you know, social tokens uh, are examples of that. I think we're going to see continued consumer applications that are built on, on these networks. Those are going to drive adoption of the sort of financialization side of this. Obviously, um, DeFi and the scale of, of, of borrowing and lending and other capital market activities happening there, it looks big right now. I think we're in store for, you know, again, multiple orders of magnitude growth in, in the coming years as well. I think all of those become major drivers. Well, Jeremy, it's always awesome to talk to you about this stuff. Uh, really exciting time. And I think a lot of great times ahead. So thanks for your time today. And uh, with that, we'll kick it back over to Nate and Mark. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Nathaniel. Thanks, Jeremy. Great conversation. Uh, next up, we are going to be talking about a perennial challenge for startups in the crypto space, uh, the whole question of banking access. Nate is going to moderate. You're in good hands. So I'm going to turn it over to Nate. Thank you, Mark. So the first uh, panel in the session focused on uh, crypto firms that were getting bank charters. Um, uh, and while that's exciting for the digital asset industry, the emergence of crypto banks doesn't mean that the tensions between uh, bankers and the cryptocurrency industry are over. Um, so here to talk about crypto investors and companies having access to bank accounts, we're going we're gonna to talk with uh, Haley Lennon, who's a partner at Anderson Kill, uh, Dave Javons, who's the CEO of Cyphertrace, and Michael Kamani, a creator with Crypto Baraza, which is a market builder of fintech, blockchain, and crypto products in Africa. And I want to just kick this off um, to, to you, Michael, first, just to talk a little bit about your experience with this issue. Not everyone, um, who, people who might be new to the crypto space might not be as aware of kind of the history of uh, crypto firms and crypto investors uh, trying to have access to bank accounts. And you're, you're a freelancer uh, with Coindesk and ran into an issue uh, with banking when it came to uh, getting paid by Coindesk. And Michael, I was curious to know if you could um, tell us a little bit about your story um, as it relates to banking and crypto. Yeah, thanks, Nate. Um, like you mentioned, I work with uh... Uh, an organization known as Crypto Baraza in East Africa. It's like a crypto think tank, crypto blockchain think tank. And uh, I've been part of the crypto blockchain industry from Kenya and East Africa for the last uh, seven or eight years. And so uh, I've, I've somehow found my way into writing for Coindesk in a market where cryptocurrencies are still in a fuzzy spot between uh, regulation and uh, outrightly illegal. So recently, uh, I've, I've written a couple of articles for Coindesk around uh, digital currencies in, in Africa and uh, some use cases for blockchain in Africa. And I had to get paid for those particular articles. And uh, I think the option I had with Coindesk was uh, my bank account. And so I had to submit my invoice with Coindesk and give them my, hand them my bank details. And yeah, so this was a dollar bank account. And after sending in my invoice with Coindesk, uh, I, I beaten back and forth with the invoice department. Um, I was told I should be expecting an, a, a wire in about five days. Uh, sometime between the five days, uh, I received a phone call from my bank, uh, a banking official. He said he worked in the audit department. And he had a couple of questions around the uh, transaction that was coming into my bank account uh, of around uh, a certain amount of dollars coming into my US dollar bank account. And uh, 
he had a few questions around what this payment was for. Why was I receiving this sum of money? And after a bit of back and forth, uh, he asked me to send him some evidence. And of course, I sent him my invoice. And we had another conversation and he said uh, that uh, they're going to be reversing the transaction uh, because the, 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 the payment I was expecting was related to cryptocurrency. So somehow some of the documents that were submitted or the incoming wire transfer was labeled with uh, something that either had crypto or associated with cryptocurrencies, in this case, Coindesk. And for that reason, they had to uh, reverse that particular transaction. Now, let me just take you back to 2015, where some years ago, a certain crypto company in Kenya known as Tesla had a bit of a tussle with the central bank over the, the, the services that they offered in this market. And the central bank since then issued a, um, a circular to all banks, asking them never to conduct business with any virtual currency related businesses so all i can do is speculate if those two are related but i thought i should add that for some context and background right so that's that's interesting michael that that uh the context of the the circular that's sent to to financial institutions um uh, similar um similar uh things have happened with with uh with u.s regulators and financial institutions but um michael in, in terms of like is this the first time that this has happened to you? Um, has there been times in the past um, where you've had issues with um, banking when it relates to your work with cryptocurrency? No, 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 not really. This is uh, this is not the first time. I think, uh, like I mentioned before, I've been doing this for for a while. So I kind of was in the Bitcoin markets and in the Bitcoin space uh, before 2015. And back in the day, we didn't really have some of these services in our markets where you could access alternative crypto, cryptos besides Bitcoin. So things like Ethereum or some emergent uh, layer two coins. So we didn't really have access to that. The only way to access that was through services like Kraken. So I used to use Kraken. Uh, I'd wire some money through my bank account. I think at that time they had some bank accounts in Japan. And that's how I funded my Kraken account. But after the circular, whenever I wanted to make uh, this wire transfer to Kraken, uh, my, my funds would get reversed. And uh, I found out later that it's because the, the details I entered on the uh, wire transfer form were related to a crypto company. And that would immediately uh, trigger a flag event within the bank. And then I'd, I'd have my funds refunded. So this was like the second or third time I've had to deal with this. And some of the people I know in this market, uh, we've also had to deal with this too. Interesting. This is, this is one of the issues that, uh, it, that when people talk about um, not being, uh, no one can ban Bitcoin. Um, it's, it's, it's true, no one can, can ban Bitcoin, but um, uh, countries can certainly um, have their banks uh, not serve or, or work with crypto firms so there's no uh, on-ramp or off-ramps for fiat um, we saw um, uh, just this past week um, uh, uh, china um, issuing uh, 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 guidance to its banks uh, to to not work with cryptocurrency firms and here in the in the u.s um, uh, there have been uh, times in the past um, where the FDIC um, has uh, has kind of discouraged banks from working uh, with cryptocurrency firms, and I wanted to uh, kick it to to Haley um, next and and kind of get your thoughts on um, banks that are wanting to get into this space, um, particularly in the U.S. since that's where uh, you're based. Um, mm -hmm. uh, how 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 does it look uh, in this bull market? Uh, versus uh, 2017 in terms of the steps um, for uh, a bank to kind of uh, get into um, uh, taking on these customers? Yeah, it's a great question and a really exciting topic. It's one that I'm super passionate about because I sort of started my crypto career in the banking crypto area at Silvergate Bank. Um, and, you know, there's a there's a 
thought that cryptocurrency is an alternative system to the banking world, but unfortunately you kind of need both currently to, to function. And, um, and crypto companies themselves have had a really hard time um, keeping and maintaining banks. Um, not even, I mean, there's two layers to banking relationships here in the US at least. There, there are instances where cryptocurrency companies just want an operating account just to pay rent and pay their employees. And it's similar to the situation you all were discussing, just paying people for their work that is somehow associated with cryptocurrency. The, the thought that that is an issue to me is kind of crazy. But then if you go a step further and you look at a bank that actually wants to provide banking, um, you know, trading accounts to cryptocurrency companies. So they're actually holding exchanges, customers funds, then, then the bank itself is, is concerned about the exchanges um, compliance program and know your customer and what what those exchanges like Kraken, Coinbase, Gemini are doing to ensure that the money that that bank is holding on behalf of those exchanges customers um, has been screened and proper due diligence has been done. Um, so that's sort of one way that that banks can can get into this space. And I think it has gotten progressively easier for banks to feel comfortable doing that, providing operating and trading accounts to crypto companies. Um, we've also seen with the OCC, there's been continued sort of assurance and clarification and guidance letters, especially when Brian Brooks was heading the OCC, um, that banks can also custody cryptocurrency themselves and um, handle stable coins and that sort of thing. So I think today more than ever, there are many opportunities for banks to get into this space. And I wish more would because I think um, somehow it's still a struggle in the industry. Right. And Dave, your in CyberTrace uh, helps um, to kind of provide that data um, the AML and KYC data um, that the banks would be looking for on those customers um, in order to in order to on, on those customers of their customers, the cryptocurrency firms, um, in order to bank those cryptocurrency firms. Um, I was curious to know, so the same question kind of um, for the difference between 2017 and now, like uh, are regulators like the FDIC and others, are they more easygoing, um, especially with the letters from the OCC, um, or are they about the same in terms of their uh, sentiment around this market? Uh, Nate, I'd say it's gotten a lot better since 2017. Um, back then, I, you know, it was largely banks like Silvergate and others that were um, in, at least in the US, the place to go to get accounts. Um, that has changed and I see a sea change now that we've seen, obviously, you know, 50,000 or in this case, these days, $38,000 Bitcoin doesn't hurt. Um, but also in demand is growing. Um, I think the IPO by Coinbase legitimizes to some extent the exchange marketplace. And so there's a, a number of banks that are looking to um, compete with some of the early, more crypto friendly banks. But there's a lot of big banks that we're looking at it as well. And that is where analytic tools can help them get comfortable with the operations of those of those cryptocurrency companies. It's been very um, surprising and also a, a great turn when I talk with our large banking customers, and some of these are the biggest banks in the world, and they're saying, you know, how do I safely bank the quality cryptocurrency exchanges and companies. So it's it's changed dramatically, even in the last, I'd say, seven or eight months. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'd add to that that I think there's two huge lifts that banks have here. One is just the overall addition to staffing. You need sort of the compliance and legal and even tech-minded people to join, and that's sort of the first uh, commitment that a bank has to make if they want to bank the space and understand the space. But the tech side of it and the tech tools that help the compliance are are just as important because they that it's the learning curve that banks have to deal deal with in this space. There's just additional implications. It's not more risky compliance wise than dollars, but there are you know, more specific technology elements to understand, including the blockchain monitoring and that sort of thing. 
Right, and and that was uh, curious, Dave, on with the data that Cipher Trace is providing um, uh, these these banks. Um, uh, is it enough uh, for for what they want in order to to jump into the space? Are there any points where um, uh, they uh, want more data up on KYC and AML? Um, things that you want to offer down the road? Yeah, so I think that. The you know blockchain analytics is a component of it. So you want to be able to look at the transactional history of an exchange, for example, if you're a bank, and you want to have alerting. Let's say, for example, something goes wrong, and suddenly there's a whole bunch of bad money flowing in or out of a of an exchange, or maybe they got hacked or that kind of thing. So you want to have that ongoing monitoring. But absolutely, the upfront um, onboarding is important as well. So now that looks today, it looks like any money service business that you're going to bring on board. What is your KYC policy? Have you had an audit? Um, who do you who do you do exchanges with? I think you'll see more compliance oriented efforts, and as Ailey um, and you know, train important. The regulations are moving, and there's no surprise here in regulations. Um, teams like CipherTrace and others have been and GDF and other groups. Uh, Digital Chamber have been working with regulators for years. So we know what's happening. It makes sense mostly, um, but that is going to require an additional burden of verification by the exchanges to the banks to say, for example, um, yes, I'm compliant with the travel rule. You know, that didn't exist a year ago and it's not even broadly enforced yet, but that change is coming and that's an example. And it won't be the only one. There will be more. Is that uh, and are is banks' interest in this, especially those large banks? Uh, are, is their interest on pause while some of the letters um, uh, uh, related to crypto at the OCC are under review, or are banks still moving full steam ahead? Uh, but uh, our experience is banks are still moving ahead, although you know we're only a couple of months into a new administration in the United States in particular. But I mean, what we see on a global basis is some of the banks that are um, testifying today at the Senate uh, Banking Committee, um, as we speak right now, are you know moving ahead with projects. Uh, but also internationally, that's happening as well on a pretty big scale. So I haven't seen any real change in tone, but we're really only a couple of months into the administration and we'll see, um, you know, what the OCC maybe wants to tighten up some of their, their recommendations and, and regulations. We'll see how, you know, how Treasury feels over the next couple of months. Um, but I don't see any backing off because the regulatory environment, in my view, is being well thought out, discussed on a global level, has industry working with it. It's not just regulators against crypto, it's regulators who want to make it safe for I, I definitely agree with that. I, I currently am, am partner at Anderson Kill and um, have, have a few clients either going for de novo um, OCC banking charters or trust charters. And so I think we're seeing both directions, the large banks coming into the space and embracing that, but also the uh, cryptocurrency companies and exchanges going for those. I know that I think there was a panel earlier today about that, so we won't go into detail on that. But um, you know, it's pretty customary and and regular course of business for a new administration to review things that a prior administration did in some of these regulatory agencies, especially when it has to do with cryptocurrency. That's such a focal point. Um, for a lot of regulators, um, and there are still plenty of skeptics out there. So, I don't, you know, I don't see any sort of doubt coming from the the industry that's interested in the space. And you know, from I was at Silvergate Bank 2014, 2015. I mean, we're in a completely different world now. Um, and I agree um, with everyone who's who's mentioning, you know, regulators are. Uh, warming up to the space have actually become very educated and know what they're talking about and, and know some of the risks. And so um, I, I, you know, through my career, I've really viewed regulators as more of an ally than an enemy. And I think that serves companies well to do so. 
um, give them the benefit of the doubt that they are looking to regulate the space in a way that makes it a better industry for everybody. Yeah, I think Haley, I'd just like to jump in here. Right. Sorry. Yeah, of course, Sorry, Michael, just, please. Yeah, I just, it's just amazing to hear how much progress uh, is happening, or quote-unquote progress, at least in terms of adoption of uh, these radical cryptos by, by banks. And I'm coming from a market where, like, we're nowhere near close to what's happening in your market. But I think I just wanted to add that uh, something interesting that has happened here is this kind of uh, banking blockade has led to like peer-to-peer -peer markets thriving. So it's as if the, all the pressure that's been dying to get into crypto somehow enabled another kind of model to thrive with the likes of uh, Paxul and local Bitcoins and even comp Guys, if you found this episode streaming valuable, then do hit the like button on this channel. Do consider subscribing into if you're into this sort of stuff. Their user acquisition strategy by implementing a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for local currencies and USDT using mobile wallets and not necessarily bank accounts. So despite this banking blockade that has happened, uh, there's been some good coming out of it, like how some, some startups have been able to innovate around this, this problem and it's allowing uh, in peer to peer markets to thrive. So, just throwing that in there as, uh, yeah. I, I think that that's a really interesting point. I mean, I don't think that a country can really avoid cryptocurrency adoption if people want it. And I also don't really think that banks can afford, um, banks can't really actually avoid having something to do with cryptocurrency. If they think that they've unbanked all the customers that are touching crypto or all the cryptocurrency related companies, they aren't. So to me, it makes a lot more sense for banks to learn about the space and tr and embrace it, even if it's not going full. Okay, this is getting a little bit dry uh, for the past few hours. So I will call it a day here. Um, I think tomorrow's streaming is going to be a bit more interesting than what we saw today. We've got Tom Brady coming to consensus uh, to speak tomorrow, most probably about NFTs. Just looking at the price, uh, Bitcoin hasn't really done much moving from where it was yesterday. It's still at the same place. But overall, I hope you had a lovely day and I hope you enjoyed the last couple hours of this live stream. And, I, and if you do want to check out the other days, I live stream day one, two and three as well. Uh, also check out Michael Saylor and what he had to say about Bitcoin mining and his conversation with Elon Musk. I have put a separate video for that and a separate one for Bitcoin's carbon footprint. And there was a panel with somebody coming from Cambridge Alternative Finances, um, uh, some, some long name, uh, <laughs> uh, something to do with Bitcoin's energy supply, um, energy usage and uh, how green it he thinks it should be in the future. So anyway, I hope you had a lovely day. Um, Otherwise, if you haven't, uh, do have a nice evening and I'll see you next time. Bye.